So thank you for this nice uh, gathering. Uh, around uh, 35 years ago, Bill Ryan gave me a piece of advice. He said, never accept an invitation for an after-dinner speech. <laughs> Remember? Is that true? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> so I'm sorry for having accepted, and you will probably be sorry also. <laughs> so, but I'm happy to make this uh, exception today. I will not try to speak French, so this will all be more or less in English. Let's start with a uh, simple definition from the encyclical. Ecology studies the relationship between living organisms and the environment in which they develop, number 138. The relationship between living organisms and the environment in which they develop, 138. Now, try to notice what that these few words bring into your head. When you think of some organism and some environment, what, what comes into your mind? Bacteria, Bacteria in the earth. What, other examples? Uh huh. Birds. So I would like to follow the last comment, which is, uh, which was a sneak preview, and ask in the spirit of the encyclical, what is the environment? And I will offer you a little exercise. Try to answer the question, what is the environment, at the moment when you first wake up in bed. You wake up and you, maybe you haven't even opened your eyes yet. What is the environment? And so I would say it's a, this exercise is a kind of composition of place and application of the senses, uh, an adjustment of the Jesuit tradition. So as, as I'm passing from sleep into wakefulness and I become aware, what do I hear? What do I smell? What do I feel? Eventually, when I first open my eyes, what do I see? And so, and this is what I find so interesting about this encyclical, and these are the words of the Pope. So what we really mean by environment is a relationship between nature and the society which lives in it. It's a relationship between nature and the, and the society which lives in it. Paragraph 139 which is basically what Joe said. Now, if you're in bed at Villa Monrez, Villa, Villa Saint-Martin here, we all know more or less what will happen if you first open your ears and then your nose and then your eyes and, and what's around you. Yeah, so so we, have, we, we understand what is our immediate sense of the environment. But if you are in bed in Port-au-Prince, that's not the same, is it? Not the same. And if you're in Kinshasa, it's not the same, and we could debate whether it's even worse. Or in Calcutta. The Holy Father feels that what comes into the ears, the nose, the eyes of the majority of people in the world when they first wake up, that's what he means by environment. He 
See, that's what he means by environment. He doesn't first think of the birds in the trees, because in Port-au-Prince you don't hear the birds in the trees, and in Kinshasa neither, and in Calcutta neither, and so on and so on. And then, an hour after you've gotten out of bed, what's happening? And if we're leaving, if it's an hour after we get out of bed here, some of us might be driving a car all by ourselves with the stereo on and with the air conditioner on, and we're rushing up and down Highway 13 here, and we're going to where we need to go. But where are the majority of the world's people after an hour in bed, after an hour after getting up out of bed? They might be on some kind of miserable piece of transportation that didn't come, and then when it finally came, it was overcrowded, and in any case, it costs 60 or 70 percent of what they're going to earn at the job, which they don't have, because they're, at best, day laborers. That's what the Holy Father means by environment, first of all. So what we really mean by environment is a relationship between nature and the society which lives in it. And in this world of ours, there are societies and there are societies. And there is a, a tendency within the encyclical, it's not total, but there's a tendency in the encyclical to, to, to be thinking of the millions and the tens of millions and the hundreds of millions who live with the great, great environmental difficulties that I'm trying to, to elicit from you. Yeah. So two points. Number one, that environment doesn't start with the birds and the trees. The, the environment starts with us, and I would say as we begin to open our eyes and ears, our noses and our lives to everything that is around us. We'll get to the trees eventually, maybe, but we don't start with the trees, as important as they are. And secondly, it is the experience of the majority. And that's, that's, that's not a moral judgment. That's not saying that the majority are better than the minority. They're just saying the majority are the majority. And they need to be given their weight. And I think we'll have to agree that in a lot of what we've done, and in a lot of what the church has said and written, they have not been given their weight. They have, as he says, come as an afterthought. So, I hope you find this little introduction helpful. I certainly have found it helpful to try to begin to appreciate what Laudato Si is. It's, it, it is about environment, but I don't know of anyone, at least in my experience, anyone who has, in a sense, started so self-understoodly talking about the environment the way uh, Pope Francis does. He, he starts the way we've tried to start this evening. And I think if you have that a little bit in the back of your mind, that will already help your reading. The encyclical has an introduction and six parts. The introduction basically is Francis saying, who is coming along with me on this trip, on this pilgrimage? He doesn't call it a pilgrimage, really. A trip. Who is coming along with me on this trip? Or who are the, the travelers who are united together with the same concern? Who, who is the group? that's going. And I think you'll be happy to hear who's in the group. Besides uh, Francis, there are three popes on this trip. Paul VI, John Paul II, and Benedict. So each of them comes, gets on board in the introduction. Each one gets onto the, whatever the vehicle is. 
So they're on board. Once we have the four popes, Francis and his three friends, then the next one who gets on board is Bartholomew, the patriarch of Constantinople. First of all, it's, I, I don't think any of us can be a Christian and not be moved at the thought that a patriarch is in an encyclical. That is itself very touching. The adjective before his name is beloved. I don't know if the word is ever used anywhere else in the encyclical. Beloved Bartholomew. So Bartholomew is the first patriarch to appear in a Catholic encyclical. He's called beloved. And the sentence ends, and this will bring tears to your eyes if you haven't seen it yet. I will read, I would mention, so now he's introducing what Bartholomew will say. I would mention the statements made by the beloved ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew. This is after Paul VI, John Paul II, and Benedict. I would mention the statements made by the beloved ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew, comma, listen, with whom we share the hope of full ecclesial communion. Madai. I mean, is that's, that, there you have it, it's in print. <laughs> so this is, I mean, we've, we're, we're, we haven't even reached paragraph 10 yet, and we are already over the moon in the sense of, of a, something that you could say, I, I wondered if I would live to see this day. I wondered if I would live. And not only those of us who are older, even younger ones, could have said, I doubt I'll ever see the day. And now I would say it looks like the day will come before Bartholomew closes his eyes. I think the unity will come with Bartholomew. That's a personal opinion. So the, the pilgrims are the three popes, Bartholomew and St. Francis. And then we're ready to take off. And an interesting thing for someone to do, maybe somebody who's writing a paper in uh, whatever, philosophy or theology, would be to, in fact, m make up the list. Who, el who are the other fellow travelers? Who are the other people named in the encyclical? It's a very interesting list, but I won't do it for you, and I, uh, but I do invite you to do it. You might ask yourself, why am I giving this talk? Uh, and the answer, of course, is obedience. But... <laughs> <laughs> But my, my, my real motivation, my real motivation, my only motivation in giving the talk is to uh, really encourage and motivate you to read the encyclical. And to read, read it as a whole, uh, to read the whole thing. In, in some ways it is like the exercises. You know, if you use the exercises without following the sequence, you're spoiling it. I mean, it's not... That's not how you should use them. You should go from the beginning to the end, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't skip things, and you shouldn't uh, change the order. And I would say, at least for your first reading, I would really encourage you to say, I'm going to read this from beginning to end. For example, I will take one chapter a day, and I will read it uh, for the, to get through it and to, to experience the itinerary. I think it, it's very helpful to do that. The, um, so read it in order. Do read it. Read it in order and don't skip. Those are the three uh, instructions. How is it organized? One proposal I would make for you is there are six chapters then and really no conclusion. Uh, so it's a in brief introduction and then six chapters. Uh, so, the, the four steps of the six chapters are see, judge, act, and praise. See, judge, act, and praise. The first two are to see. The next two are to judge. The, the fifth is to act, strategy. 
and the sixth you might say is praise or you could call it formation and spirituality. So the first one asks the question, what is happening to our common home? And so this is clearly to see, to see, to take a look at our common home. And this is where the Holy Father gives us a summary of the contemporary science of the environment. So this is, this is another one of the, I think, one of the very dramatic moments that I want to share with you. We all know that there's going to be science in the encyclical. It's what has been most discussed and criticized ahead of time, before it was read. But allow me to, to ask you, why is the science there? Why is the science there? And I think that the answer is because the Holy Father wants to prove to all the skeptics and to anybody else who's indifferent that this is a serious problem. But this is what he says. And he, he could have said, I will give you the best of science, because the scientists in the last two months who have, said, who have read it said that this first chapter is the best summary, the best status questionis you can have today on the issues that are treated there. This is, this is no Mickey Mouse, you know, kind of... Huh? It's not Walt Disney, exactly. It's, it's an excellent summary of, the, of, of what humanity knows and should know today. Why? Listen very carefully. Listen for, with ears of, of retreat, not with ears of the head. The best of science, says the Holy Father, not to amass information or to satisfy curiosity, but rather to become painfully, painfully aware to dare to turn what is happening to the world into our own personal suffering and thus to discover what each of us can do about it. To make of what's happening in the world our home, it's called our home, to turn it into our own personal suffering. I think this is extraordinary. This is very Ignatian. I mean, I think we've been trying to do this uh, first week and especially third week during the retreat. And I think we know that unless, <coughs> unless we feel something, unless it's in our guts, it's just going to go like this. So the first step in seeing, in grasping, is to, is to get it inside. But in the seven parts of this first chapter, we talk about, we start with pollution. Pollution is interesting because remember when we were in bed at the beginning, the first thing that happens when you wake up is what you smell, right? And what you smell is, will already tell you where you are. So here we don't even notice, but in many parts of the world, pollution is actually what reaches people first. It's already in their homes. And even here, uh, probably pollution, Los Angeles, New York, and so on, maybe even some Canadian cities, it's, it's already reaching us. So pollution, in a sense, is the first. So there's pollution, there's water, there's biodiversity. But the next part of this chapter, which is about seeing, is about global inequality. And that's not inequality between horses and cows. That's inequality among us. So, right from the start, you see a very important fact, which is that this encyclical is not about social issues and environmental issues. It's about one crisis which has two faces or two aspects, human, social, and environmental or natural. <coughs> it's about the poor and the planet. Not two separate crises, but one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. The next chapter, chapter two, which I think is also seeing, is called the Gospel of Creation. And here, the, the Holy Father gives a certain, you might say, a place for faith, 
really for all faiths, but then explicitly our faith, and he does a review of what we've learned from Scripture, and about, uh, especially about the Creator. I think if there's a single main point that he would like to get across to those who are not Christians, and to some of us who are, is that there really is the Creator, with a capital C, and that if you don't grasp that, you're not going to grasp most anything else. And that we, our vocation is, is, you might say, is dominion, but not domination. Dominion comes from dominus, or Lord, and that we are to exercise lordship the way God exercises lordship, which is basically providential or caring. God never is exploitive. God is never ruthless. God is never greedy. God is never rough. So why do we think dominion justifies that in us? No. So we are to exercise dominion the way God does, or to use the two expressions in, in uh, the nice English translation, to till and to keep. To till, to use the soil, to use the resources, and to keep, to care for the resources. That is our vocation, is to till and to keep. And one little <clears throat> slogan that you can use is that we have tilled too much and kept too little. That's what we've discovered. Tilled too much and kept too little. My idea is to finish speaking before they change the next tape. So in other words, there'll be less than, uh, I will speak for half an hour and then we'll have uh, exchange. So that's why I will get through the six points, but not much else. So, uh, if you can appreciate then, the first two points of seeing, one is to see scientifically, and the other is to see scripturally, uh, religiously. And he says that if you, don't, if you refuse to see religiously, you're not going to see all of reality. He says that quite clearly, and that's his understanding. He's, the religious dimension is not imposed on, the, on any reader, because this encyclical is addressed to everybody, not just to Christians or not just to believers. But this second chapter helps us who are Christians to see as Christians, and hopefully others to realize that they also need to see religiously and spiritually, otherwise they're not going to see the whole thing. Now we come to the second pair of chapters to judge. And the first chapter that, of judge, number three, is negative, and the second one is positive. So number three <coughs> are the human roots of the ecological crisis. The human roots of the eco ecological crisis. And here, again, I have the feeling that Francis does something which we don't really expect. We, um, I mean, I don't know how each of you would analyze the ecological crisis and say, well, what, you know, whether it's due to greed or whether it's due to stupidity or whether it's due to lack of foresight. But the, the pejorative word that he uses, the, the single pejorative word that he uses to sort of sum up the problem is technocracy. Technocracy. It's, it's the rule of technology uh, allied with... Uh, capitalism or finance capitalism that drives uh, this uh, model of development that is, that is consuming the planet. So, in one sense, you could say that Laudato Si, whose um, subtitle is On Care for Our Common Home, could have a different subtitle. It could be Laudato Si, A Critique of Power a critique of power. I ask myself if any encyclical has taken on power so directly. I think most encyclicals until now have talked about consequences of the misuse of power, but this one goes for power itself. I won't underline it. I think it's pretty, uh, pretty dramatic. Allow me another trick to try to communicate the genius of the encyclical, because again, I think it's something you wouldn't expect. Um, 
I don't know how many of you share this uh, belief, or maybe it's a superstition, but um, if you look at the middle, the, the middle of a text, yes, if you open a text to what's at the, at the halfway point, sometimes it's an interesting clue to what it's all about. If you open, and it's in the chapter that we're talking about now, halfway through, you open it in the middle, what are we going to find in the middle of an encyclical about the environment and the misuse of power? What, what, is, going to, what is the Pope going to talk about at the very middle? He's going to talk about work. He's going to talk about employment. At the heart of this encyclical is the need to protect and to promote employment. I came up with another uh, cliche, which you can use in advertising if you like. And, but this is my own. This is not from the encyclical. A world economy which cannot provide work for the world's people should be ashamed of itself. Let me repeat. A world economy which cannot provide work for the world's people should be ashamed of itself. Why do we have the economy if it's not so that we can all work? Of course, that's very socialist, isn't it? <laughs> By the way, if you, if you like this kind of thing, if you look for all the, the, the strongest socialist statements in the encyclical, you could make a collection of them and, and print it in red with big black letters. They're all from John Paul and, and Benedict. All of them. They're, none, of, none of them, the Pope never says it himself. He always quotes Benedict or John Paul. For, all, for his most, <laughs> for his, his pinkest statements. The fourth chapter is called integral, integral Ecology. And so we had the negative judgment, the roots, the human roots of the ecological crisis, power, anthropocentrism, relativism. And now we come to the positive judgment, the kind of proposal, and that's Integral Ecology. And let me just give you the, the dimensions. What are the dimensions of an integral, a full, a balanced, a, a total, a holistic ecology? It will be environmental. We all agree on that. But it will also be economic. It will be social. Yeah, so because it's one, one crisis. It will be cultural. A whole section on culture. The culture of... Ecology, culture of ecology, or ecological culture. And here, and this is my total favorite, the next part of an integral ecology is the cities. Is the cities. Most of us live, and soon practically all of us will live in cities. I think, again, this is the first piece of church teaching which actually takes the cities seriously, as they're where most of humanity lives. If you look back at the earlier encyclicals, you'd think that everybody lives in the suburbs. But that's not true, my dears. <laughs> Most of them live in the cities, and they live very badly in the cities. Pope Francis is obsessed with the quality of life in the cities. The quality of life in our cities is key environmental issue. Transportation, housing, water, aesthetics. How most of us live. Most of us. Not the ones in this room with a few exceptions, but the majority of humankind are already living in unlivable megacities. This is what worries him. This is what worries him. And this section includes the common good and intergenerational justice. So these are the elements of integral theology, integral ecology. Chapter 5 is lines of approach and action. That is, what shall we do? One word answer. Now remember, this is the church speaking. Yeah, so this is not a, a UN document. This is not a policy paper. This is the church. What does the church say must be done? One word, dialogue. The whole chapter is about dialogue. International dialogue, national dialogue, local dialogue, transparent dialogue, all kinds of dialogue. Religion and science, politics and economy. Finally, the last chapter. Now, I'm tempted not to even tell you because I want you to read the first five and then reach the sixth and be delighted. <laughs> but I'll give you a little sneak preview. 
It's called ecological education and spirituality. And basically, it's like saying, okay, we've come this far, but, I mean, how are we going to make it on this trip? What are the resources we need on this trip? And we need to be educated, and we need a conversion. And that's the point of the sixth uh, chapter. And, in fact, the third part of it is called ecological conversion, which we desperately need. And the fifth part is the virtue without which we're not going to make it. And this is a virtue that you've never heard of before. It's called civic and political love. Civic and political love. It's a virtue that we need, otherwise we're going to go to hell. That's really true. So a, a, a conversion of our leadership, and basically what he's saying to leaders is you have to have the courage, you, the political leaders, have to have the courage I won't use the Anglo-Saxon word. You have to have the courage to take hold of the economy. You cannot allow the economy to run everything. You've got to exercise your responsibility. And if you haven't the courage to do that, then you should resign, because it's not worth being a leader if you can't show leadership, and if you just let them run it the way they want to, and run it into the ground the way they're doing it. <coughs> and this sixth chapter, takes off and goes into the mystical heights. So that's how the encyclical works. And, uh